We're live. Hey, this is the first ever Keep Hammering podcast. You decided on that? Yeah, we got to do that. Keep it's Hammering? The, yeah, it's the right way. Yeah. It's the right name. With Cameron Haynes. <laughs> My first guest, I'd like to introduce everybody to Joe Rogan. Hi, everybody. Joe Rogan is a, a bow hunter, <laughs> first and foremost, right? Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, comedian. UFC commentator, and my friend. Yeah, we're buddies. Right. So we're, what are we going to talk about? Go hunting? <laughs> it's up to you. This is the beautiful thing about these podcasts is the first one, uh, it'll be like, uh, how do we do this? What yeah. are we doing? And yeah. then after a while, it'll become something you understand and you do all the time. And uh, I have 100% faith that Keep Hammering is going to be a fucking awesome podcast <laughs> that I will have subscribed <laughs> on my iPhone and yeah. others will as well. I think uh, I think it's a great avenue for people to get to understand your mindset and people that are already inspired by you and follow you on social media. I think uh, I think it's a great thing. I, I really do. I think it's mostly great for people that hate me. They have <laughs> more things to hate me about. <laughs> you could look at it that way, Mr. Glass Half Empty. I'm a glass half full kind of guy. <laughs> now, as I've said before, I wish I believed in myself the way Joe does. Joe... But I trust Joe because he's been very successful in almost, I mean, I know you've had failures, but you've had a lot of successes. And so if you say, this is a great avenue for you, this is a great thing you should do, I'm going to help you do it, I trust you. And so here we are. Well, when people love someone on my podcast and mm -hmm. people, I have gotten so many Instagram messages, Facebook messages, so many messages from people and met people in person mm -hmm. that have told me that because of knowing you, they started practicing archery, they started running, they started getting healthier because of your direct inspiration. Mm -hmm. So I know that you have this effect on people and I know for a fact that this podcast is going to be successful and I know you're an interesting guy with a lot of crazy stories mm -hmm. and a lot of people probably don't know a lot of this stuff about you. Yeah. I think it'll be... It'll be interesting, it'll be entertaining, and I just think it's a no-brainer. Well, thank you. And <laughs> uh, what I want to, you know, if this is my podcast, and this is what I want to talk about, um, if I'm in control, I'm always, I'm going to talk about bow hunting. Bow hunting has changed my life. Um, you know, people who, who know my story, I guess, I don't know, I've shared a little bit of it, but if they know my story, they know that, you know, I came up, I was just like any other kid, uh, you know, parents were divorced, um, all sorts of issues growing up, moved back and forth with uh, my dad to my mom, to my dad to my mom, I'm um, just trying to be happy, you know, and uh, I got, I had some direction in high school and that was through sports and that's, uh, that, that made me, I, I wanted to work hard, I wanted to be the best athlete I could be, you know, I'm not saying I was great. Um, I wanted to be a good student, so, uh, y you know, nobody really pushed me. Nobody, um, nobody was right there saying, you need to do better. I just wanted to do better on my own. So, uh, but after that, I was pretty much lost, didn't really have any direction. And then bow hunting gave me something to work hard, uh, something that challenged me, something that not everybody was good at it. And so when I was successful bow hunting, um, it gave me a lot of confidence and for a, a young man um, having confidence in anything uh, and getting positive reinforcement from anything was a powerful time in my life. So that's that's how bow hunting started for me. And then what I've what I've enjoyed about the whole process is seeing so bow hunting changed my life essentially because I went from there to uh, where we are now. And uh, um, now what I like, I like exposing new people to something that's changed my life and that's you know people like you taking you on your first bow hunt i'm um, seeing you become totally enamored with the bow and arrow has been amazing for me um so tell tell me about your experience bow hunting well i want people to know one thing about you before you you when you kind of glossed over your childhood and something i didn't know about you and you told me when we were on our trip to brazil together that um, your dad was a very successful athlete. Mm -hmm. I think that's a lot of thing. That's something that a lot of people don't know about you. Is that mm -hmm. that's you. You know, you had like kind of a freak athlete for a dad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, 
you know, my dad, uh, man, you know, my mom and dad were divorced when I was five. And so my dad was always like this legend, you know, I didn't get to see him very much, but I heard a lot about him. And I remember my mom would say, um, she'd say, you know, your dad, his, his, like if this wood table right here, your dad's legs are as hard as this wood table. They're so muscular. And I mean, I was five when she told me that and I, I never forgot that. And so my dad, he was like this larger than life thing that, uh, I always wanted, I always looked up to. And, um, even just recently, you know, I took my daughter to pole vault practice. She's been pole vaulting, which was, my dad was, a he was a gymnast and a track athlete and, you know, great athlete, as you mentioned, but I took her to pole vault practice just a couple weeks ago. And, the and the guy, there's two instructors there and they said, so did I hear right that, uh, your daughter is, is, uh, Bob Haynes's granddaughter. And I said, yeah, I said, that's, uh, Bob, you know, that was my dad. I'm his oldest son. And, uh, they just said, you know, your dad was one of the most amazing athletes the city ever produced. And, uh, th this was, they went to high school with them. I think they're a little younger than him, but, uh, so yeah, my dad, um, he, yeah, he could do amazing things. I don't think I got that from him, but, uh, it was always in the back of my mind that that was our connection with, was athleticism. Um, he, he never hunted. So I, I grew up with my mom. I lived in a small town and hunting was a big part of growing up there. So my dad never really got that. But he did get um, my drive in endurance sports. And, I mean, he was, he was always proud of me for hunting. He'd make fun of me and say, you know, every time you kill an animal, you lose a brain cell. And so he, he would make fun of that, you know. But I always, you know, I wrote two books, and he was hustling my books as harder than anyone. So he, 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 uh, he supported me, and he loved me, even though he didn't hunt. But our... Um, where I felt we had the uh, connection was, um, through running and, um, you know, cause he know as, as an athlete coming up, he knows what it takes to sacrifice and to, and to try to be the best. And, you know, so di different things like, you know, running, running against, uh, Lance in Boston was something he, man, he, he loved that whole experience because they were, they were filming Lance. Lance Armstrong. For yeah. People listening. Right. During that whole race. And so I was running with Lance for 13 miles. And so I was on, on TV the whole time, basically. And so, you know, that was, that was pretty cool for him. You also got to see the consequences of, uh, not living a healthy, clean life from your dad. Yeah. Uh, you know, my dad was an alcoholic and, um, uh, I think it, um, you know, every. I'm not perfect, so I can't, I can't judge him, but I know that, uh, um, he had a lot of potential that, uh, he never got to take advantage of because of drinking. So, um, you know, he didn't drink for, I think over 30 years and before he died, you know, he died when he was 63, which is still pretty young from cancer and he hadn't smoked and, you know, he'd lived clean for a long time, but who knows why, you know, he got cancer, but, uh, as far as in the prime of his life as an athlete, um, drinking kind of sabotaged that a little bit. But, uh, I think that it was almost a blessing in disguise. Cause yeah, he didn't get the individual glory of, um, who knows where, who knows where his career would have taken him. You know, I don't know if he could have made the Olympics, but I mean, you could always make that argument. He, I think he jumped six, four, um, in high jump doing the Western roll, which is, different from the Fosbury flop, which, which they say w could have added eight inches to his jump. So that would have put him at, if he would have learned the new technique, he had the, the, uh, ability to maybe go seven foot. And then that's getting close. That's up, in the, you know, Olympic caliber at that time. And then, you know, I don't know, it would have been late sixties, but anyway, so I think it was almost a blessing in disguise because, uh, while he didn't get the individual glory, he, um, made an impact on so many kids in coaching back at South Eugene high school that, uh, you know, he, I still get messages from, from kids that he coached on the positive impact. And even those coaches that were coaching my daughter in pole vault the other day, they said that he changed kids lives. Um, um, just by taking, just be, by being able to get kids out for track and just supporting them, especially kids that were having, um, 
you know, their own challenges. Um, he, he knew what, how hard it could be growing up and navigating life in general. And so he would, would take kids under his arm that needed support. And, um, man, he impacted thousands of kids over 30 some years of coaching. So, um, I don't think he would, he would regret anything. It's just, that's life. That's how it plays out. Um, but it's also a, a reason why, um, I am the way I am, you know, he's, he's a legend to me growing up, even though I didn't get to be around him as much when I was a kid because of, um, the divorce. But, uh, you know, we got close before he died and I saw the impact he had on people and he's, you know, always, um, who I wanted to make proud. So it's still my dad. That's awesome. Competitive athletics are always like very difficult stress wise. And there's a lot, a lot of people that self-sabotage. You know, I was just having a conversation real recently with uh, Dana White about that, about how many guys get real close to, uh, like, championship caliber potential, mm -hmm. and then they wind up fucking their life up, almost mm -hmm. as if they're trying to fuck their life up to alleviate some of the pressure of mm -hmm. attempting to perform at their best. Mm -hmm. And um, I think uh, that that's probably something that a lot of us face. There's a lot of little demons that go creeping around in the minds of people that are trying to accomplish great things or yeah. great, great in their opinion or difficult things, I should say, rather than great. Yeah, I think, and I'm not saying I've been to this place, but, you know, I set big goals for myself. Um, I push my body very hard. And it's like you think uh, sometimes... I haven't, I haven't had this, but I could see where it happened. But an injury is almost like a relief, you know. It's a relief. Yeah, ah, I was gonna do it, but you know, who knows what Achilles, right. uh, rolled an ankle, what, whatever. Um, and it's almost like a relief, you know, because when you're at that level and you're pushing, you're trying to give everything you got, um, you're invested a lot. And when that investment doesn't pay off or potentially won't pay off, that can be devastating. And uh, so sometimes it's, if you have an out, it's, you know, it's an out. But yeah, yeah. you were talking about that with running your uh, ultra marathon. That, you know, like you almost, your brain's trying to concoct exit strategies. <laughs> it was, you know, because I had, you know, when I was doing that 24-hour race, I had these big goals and I wanted to, you know, I wanted to get 120 miles. I mean, that was... That was my goal, 120 miles in 24 hours, and I felt like I should. my training took me there, and I should have been able to do it. And because of whatever reason, I didn't get it. You know, I, I changed midstream on tactics, I guess. But at the end of the day, I knew I wasn't going to get 120 miles. And so I was coming up in, in my head these reasons why I wouldn't or could I make an excuse or, you know, what and. I didn't. I didn't quit. I kept going. I got 102. I didn't get 120. And um, could I be disappointed? Yeah. Was I? Probably a little bit. But that's just part of the deal. When you set big goals, sometimes you don't get them. Isn't that a weird aspect of the human brain? It's very strange that we sabotage. Mm -hmm. We set up these little things that people who experience pressure become, you know, some people become um, it's just they go crazy or they have emotional problems or they have a lot of relationship trauma. Mm -hmm. I see that a lot with, uh, with fighters and with, uh, any p people that are trying to accomplish things that are very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. A lot of times like that drama p plays out in their personal lives. Yeah. They start having all these, uh, girlfriend fights and wife fights and all this bullshit. And they're like, they almost set themselves up. And uh, it's such a recurring pattern that you have to wonder, okay, am I seeing just the repercussions of living a stressful life where, you know, you have just way too much going on and way too much stress and pressure and you crack mm -hmm. and then it, it, it oozes over into other areas of your life? Or is it that you're sabotaging yourself? Yeah. That you're not trying to reach your best and that you're finding comfort in, man, I would have made it if it wasn't for that bitch I was married to. Right. You know, and guys have these crazy exit strategies right yeah i mean it's just it, it's just it's convenient and you know i've thought about that too because i i get a lot of messages people saying well i look up to you thank you for the motivation thank you for the inspiration and you know it's so powerful to me on one hand on another hand i know my weaknesses and i know okay if i screw up what if i 
I don't even know what. What if I do quit a race? Or what if I um, just mess up? Humans mess up. And am I going to let all these people down? And I just, I feel pressure for not letting people down. Always saying the right thing. Always not getting mad online. And even though I want to get mad, not (laughs) lose. And so it's like... uh, We've had a lot of conversations about just, that. Just, just doing, never, I guess it's the best way to term it is never letting people down. And right. it's, um, I, I'm not trying to, you know, cry about anything because it's what I signed up for. But uh, I feel the pressure sometimes. I get it. You know, I get why people, um, and I'm not in any spotlight compared to some people, but I get why people struggle sometimes with, with things like that. It's natural. Mm-hmm. It's, um, you know, and you and I have had many, many conversations about navigating the waters of social media mm-hmm. where I've laughed at you. I'm like, why are you paying attention to these people? <laughs> you can't yeah. because you're, you're in l- allowing people into your world that you don't know and you can't trust them to be rational. So if they're irrational or mean or nasty to you, like you can't dwell on this crazy person's thoughts No, because if you do, it's going to creep into your head and then you're going to no. develop a relationship with that person in your head. You're going to be like, well, you don't even fucking know how much work it takes because th- you'll start arguing with them in your head and now they've pulled you into a crazy world. Yeah. No, I, I get it. And I mean, it, it, <laughs> it makes perfect sense sitting right here, dude. <laughs> But when I feel like, and I, I don't, I don't want to sit here and say that I work harder than anybody else out there. But when you work super hard for something, and people question a what, how you do it, why you do it, um, all these different things, and you're that invested personally, the blood, sweat, and tears, I get defensive. Yeah. I mean, it's because I, cause I, I've put so much into it, then when I get questioned by it, I'm like, oh. it's, it's, it's just frustrating. It's natural, but it's also really important what you're saying, that you recognize your position as a spokesperson, and that you, uh, you take great pride in doing that correctly, and in the difficulty of navigating those waters. Mm-hmm. So if you're navigating the waters of someone who people look up to, and, you know, maybe some people think, how could someone look up to you, you animal yeah, hating, you know, sure all that. the nonsense, right? All the nonsense. <laughs> but if you, um, if you think about the responsibility of, I have personally been inspired by many, many people in my life mm-hmm. and you including, you inspire me as well. Um, and I recognize that and I think, well, this is a, this is a powerful force that someone can bestow uh, upon you, they can give you in your life where you read about what they're doing or hear about th- their thoughts or see their actions and you get inspired and actually gives you energy. Mm-hmm. And I think that inspiration is one of the most powerful things that a person experiences in their life communicating with other people. I think there's two incredibly p- powerful things there's love and there's inspiration, and they're almost equal. Maybe we would love having a slight advantage, mm-hmm. but inspiration is giant and when you are um, a channel of inspiration when like you think of a river and a river have all, has all these tributaries and branches Whoa, I just lost the thing. Hold on a second. we'll be right back folks there we go sorry <laughs> I got crazy I'm Italian I start moving my hands around um, when you you have developed this very strong channel of the river that people are tuned into now mm-hmm. and you know it's not like when someone says like my YouTube channel like, well, you have an actual channel. Mm-hmm. Like, it's a channel. And in that channel, it's a, it's a channel of thoughts. It's also like a channel of inspiration. There's just something where people go to it, and they go to it, and they're getting energy out of it. Mm-hmm. It's a very, very, very positive thing. So in, in being the curator of this very, very positive thing, which you, you have uh, manufactured by just being you mm-hmm. and pursuing your goals and trying to set your goals and trying to accomplish these very, very difficult things like these ultra marathons and these high country mountain elk hunts and all the, these different things that you're doing, you're giving out fuel and you're also setting an example that you yourself have to now aspire to mm-hmm. because you want to get mad at these trolls. You want to you tell them to F off and mm-hmm. you know kiss my ass stupid, and but you can't. Right. Because you represent not just Cameron Haynes, you represent Under Armour and Hoyt, and you are a professional spokesperson for this growing and very powerful sport of bow hunting. Yeah. What I, what I don't, one thing I don't think about when I'm answering people or dealing with people, I never think about my sponsors. And my sponsors might not like hearing that, <laughs> but if Under Armour 
while I, I appreciate everything they've done and Hoyt, same, same thing. And everybody who's believed in me, if they drop me tomorrow, they drop me tomorrow. What, who I don't want to let down is people who don't quote, do anything for me. Um, the followers who have, who have been inspired by me or are doing more because of maybe following me, my family, my kids, that's who I don't want to let down the money. I, I don't, I don't care about money. I don't care about sponsors. I appreciate everything they do for me and they've believed in me after all these years. But the people I don't want to let down are the people who aren't writing me checks. They're people who, you know, like my my um, family who look at me and I just want to make proud and I don't want them to read something I said and think that, did dad say that to somebody right. or, right. you know, so, I mean, it's, uh, you know, I don't know. I it's, I just keep feeling like I'm complaining about no. this. No, I, you're not. I'm not complaining at all. What I think you're doing is you're saying that your intentions are pure. I guess. I mean, you're. I mean, they and they are. You and you really do want to represent those people. You really do want to present a positive image to those people because I've seen the the tweets that you get and the text messages and the Instagram messages. Mm -hmm. I've seen all the people that you've influenced. I've seen it. I've seen it firsthand. So you, I think you take great pride. And that responsibility of being the curator of this channel of positivity. Yeah. One thing that is difficult is making everybody happy. Yeah. <laughs> that's uh, more like impossible. Yeah. That that's uh, that's a challenge, you know, and, and for me personally, um, I know I try to be an open book. I try to share my failures, uh, my successes. Um, and the only thing like like with the training is or obsession to. I guess bow hunting. I mean, I've, me and Roy, uh, we, we, when we're in the mountains, we put everything was back burner other than w what do we need to do to achieve our goals? And it's just like, so I've been tunnel visioned and some people have a hard time relating to that tunnel vision aspect just because hunting for some is just a getaway, uh, maybe a hobby, which is fine. Um, it's not like all encompassing or even the challenges that I take on in the training. It's just like people aren't that serious about it. So sometimes I've had, I've been like, God, do I even want to say what I've really done? You know, I mean, because I get judged, I get judged. I get judged by, uh, I don't know, you know, I mean, the other day, well, do you ever spend time with your family or do you, um, you know, success on a hunt isn't the only thing or, you know, and it's just like, so sometimes I just don't want to, um, sometimes I, I think, or I water down what I do and, you know, I don't, then, then I'm mad at myself for that too. I don't know. Well, you have high standards for yourself too. Yeah. <clears throat> it's not a bad thing, man. You know, and I think that even in not being able to ha make everybody happy, one, one of the things that that's positive about that is that it forces you to examine your own personal values and say, okay, these people are upset at me. <clears throat> now let me separate myself from me, look at what I've done or what I've said or who I am and see if I agree with them. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I do agree with them in some sort of a strange way, then I have to reevaluate my own personal behavior. And I think there, there's, there's good in that, in that it's always good to look at yourself from other people's perspective to get a real objective version of who, you from someone else, from someone else's uh, uh, opinion and, and life experiences all wrapped up in a person. But also because it allows you to dismiss nonsense criticism yeah. easier. Because you go, oh, well, this doesn't make any sense. So you are a person that's not thinking that clear. And there's a lot of people that are not thinking that clear. And if you don't agree with that, go online and look at the people with tattooed faces and they cut <laughs> their tongue in half and drill yeah. holes in their ear and put horns on their head. People are crazy. Yeah. And you, you can't. You can't listen to everybody. It no. is impossible. Those people with those cut tongues and all that crazy, they're there to remind you, oh, we don't all see eye to eye on this thing. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, one thing, you know, I, get, I do get a lot of questions on how I balance everything with, between the training and the bow hunting and the, even traveling down here. Um, one thing I do for guys out there with families is I do try to, I, I, and I've said before, I'm not a, I'm not. Okay, I'm probably not the perfect dad. I'm not the dad who sits around and plays Yahtzee or Monopoly or card games. So how how I try to to include my kids in what I do is 
They, they've all run with me. My daughter lifts weights with me. My boys have all lifted weights with me. So that's, that's like our time every day we spend together. And that's, I just kind of incorporate my family, uh, my wife, um, this weekend and the weekend she goes running with me. She usually does. I go running a couple times a day. She'll go with me one time. So that's our time. Um, so I just include my family into what I feel like I need to do. It's a benefit to everybody. We get that. And I think, you know, the quality time, like with my daughter lifting, that's just her and I, that's just a, a, a bond we have. And so I don't know, it's more powerful than if we were sitting there watching TV together, you know, because we're actually doing something. She's learning how to lift. She's pushing herself. We're sharing that together and we have fun. So, um, to the guys out there with families that, you know, bow hunting takes commitment. It takes time. So I would just try to include your family in, in as much as that as you can, you know, they won't go on the hardcore hunts, obviously, but my kids have hunted. They've been to Africa. They've been to Alaska. They've killed elk, bear, deer, uh, multiple animals in Africa. So they, they've been exposed to it. I've shared it with them. And I think that's for any, for anybody out there who's navigating those waters. That's the best advice I can give is just try to include your family and in, in what you can. And I know that you set goals like as an athlete, you know, you set goals as far as like wanting to run the Bigfoot 200 or wanting to run 120 miles in the 24 hour race. Mm -hmm. Do you set goals when it comes to your hunting? Um, my goal is success on every hunt. Um, so I've, the last unsuccessful big game hunt I've done is, was in 2009. And, Whoa. uh, I, uh, that's crazy. Yeah. Me and Roy were in the back country of Wyoming and called a bull in a nice six point and, uh, he was coming down the ridge and I arranged a tree. I thought he was the same distance as a tree. So I arranged a tree at 50. He came and he was actually a little further than the tree. And uh, I shot for 50. I don't know why I didn't range him. I just screwed up and uh, I shot right under him. So since 2009, I've been successful on every hunt, every, I only bow hunt on every hunt since then. So I go, I train for success um, and I'm not happy unless I'm successful. So um, yeah, I, I set big goals for hunting also. It's interesting because hunting, even though hunting is this primal thing where you're going out and acquiring meat in this natural way, it's also, in a sense, some sort of strange competition with nature. Like, you, you can't beat nature. No one mm -hmm. beats nature. We're all natural. We're all going to die. And we're mm -hmm. all, we'll have a ticking time bomb going off inside of us. Yeah. But there's also, there's, there's some kind of competition with, it's a difficult task. And you're you're comp you're in a sense competing because you're trying to navigate this very difficult task. Mm -hmm. You know, putting the perfect arrow into the vitals of a giant animal, mm -hmm. getting close enough to be able to do that, figuring out the wind and all that. There's like this is complex puzzle that's going mm -hmm. on. Yeah, and you know, with hunting, hunting is just uh, man, it's a whole different endeavor. It just just because you put in the work doesn't mean you're going to be a great hunter. Yeah. You know, you're trying to outwit an animal in their natural environment. And when you're using a bow, you're trying to get within in the red zone in bow range. And you can be in great shape. You can be a great shot. Doesn't mean you're going to be a great hunter. You got to you know? be able to figure it all out, right? It's you're, sort of like being a great fighter. You could look great in the gym or when you're yep, hitting the bag. Exactly. Can you put it together? Yeah. And, and can you implement that game plan? And it's, uh, it's almost, I think it's, I don't want to dis discount or uh, fighting at all but i think when you're fighting and i don't know but men have tendencies so when you're training for another man you can break down film you can you know act on tendencies with an animal it's it's really hard to to predict what they're going to do they mm. will do whatever they want to do so it's just like it's almost harder than than fighting it feels like because it's not man versus man does that make sense? It, I, it totally makes sense. Uh, they, I mean, I, I wouldn't say one is harder. Um, they have some similarities in that they're both very difficult. Right, yeah. But there's another thing going on with hunting that doesn't exist really in the same way in, in competing in f combat sports, and that is the ability to 
execute fine motor skills under incredible pressure mm -hmm. in a way where you have to be calm, 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 and still. And you're actually, like when you're amped up on adrenaline, it's almost easy to move quick. And yeah. if your body gets used to like reacting and flinching and bouncing away, yeah. that becomes like sort of your main mode. And right. I think if you took a lot of hunters and or a lot of uh, martial artists who have competed and then you make them hunt mm -hmm. you know like one of the more difficult things is going to be to stay calm yeah to stay and calm slow down. and slow the fuck down and not don't move at all yeah and to keep everything still when you're executing the shot yeah That's... and also the the amount of practice that yeah. you need to do one thing to do one thing right yeah release an arrow yeah. Seems like everybody knows how to do it, right? Straighten your left arm out, pull your right arm back, look yeah. through that peephole. You see that pin? Center it. Yeah. Okay, not that hard, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. And so when those emotions are going crazy and, yeah. you know, that bull's coming in or you finally stalk that big mule deer buck in the mountains and you're finally going to get that opportunity, guys blow the shot. All the, I mean, I blew, if I would have got every animal I shot at when I first started bow hunting, I'd need like two houses to fill a trophy room but i blew so many opportunities because i could not keep calm you know and so now um it's it's just experience do you have a shot sequence do you have something that you do in your head i do i mean when i get ready to shoot no matter what it is um grizzly big bull elk but i'll be ready and i can kind of predict when when it's going to happen but before i even pull back i'll just take a deep breath let it out, and I'll just consciously think about my arm, my uh, shoulders relaxing. I'll let that breath out, then I'll pull back, and uh, I just feel like um, that puts me in the frame of mind I need to be in. So just the big deep breath. Big deep breath, and I do that every time, just because uh, nowadays, and that's been probably five years I've been doing that, um, just because it's so it's so intense, and people who haven't done it. Um, you can't simulate that. Mm. I mean, I would always look for opportunities for high pressure situations, which is why when Cabela's wanted me to uh, cut the grand opening ribbon, I came up with this uh, this plan to shoot the ribbon with my bow because I knew there'd be thousands of people there. There'd be news cameras there. There'd be all these things there. And I'm like, okay, I need to create these intense opportunities just so I learn how to perform in them. So I'd always try to do things like that or, or uh, you know, shoot with friends and put money on the line or, you know, just different things. And I think that all pays off in crunch time on an animal because pressure is pressure, so to speak. It still is never an intense as when that bull's coming in and you're trying to you're trying to factor in so many different things because you're looking at the animal, you're reading his body language, you don't know if where his cows are, where other bulls are, if he just got in a fight, if he, what kind of call to make, this or that, you got to wait for him to turn broadside. I want that near leg to go forward. There's all these things happening and he's moving the whole time and there's trees and limbs and um, it's just a lot to, to factor in. You got distance, you, you know, I use a single pin sight here, so I need to make sure that sight's dialed in right. And it's just, you have to be calm and in control to do all that and execute a perfect shot. Not easy. Um, so it's, that's, that's why I say it's, and you mentioned the fighter who looks good in the gym and, you know, is in great physical shape. It's just like, yeah, you can be, you can be prepared physically. You can be a great shot with your bow, but it's that experience in hunting that tells you when to draw back and what the animal is going to predict, what the animal is going to do and put yourself in a position to capitalize. That just comes with years of experience. And so I've been bow hunting now for 30 years and I always almost 30 years, not quite 30, but I would do a lot of pig hunts down here in California. I'd go on as many hunts as I could because, um, the fact of the matter is to get good at killing, you got to kill. And since that's why I'm out there, I'm, of course, I want meat for my freezer. I, I, I want everything else, but I want to be successful, number one. To get good at that, I just need to know what it takes on whatever species I'm hunting, whatever country I'm hunting. And, and so it's just, it's just like reps through a bow, uh, miles preparing for a marathon. It's just experiences hunting. And that's, you can't shortcut that. You, it's, yeah, martial arts the same way. Mm -hmm. no, in, in, it's also that it's open-ended. And that when you're hunting, you, you make all the moves. You mm -hmm. go left, you go right, you pause, you slow down. You have to, 
you don't have a script you're following. So you right. have to you have to be able to figure out what is the correct thing to do mm -hmm. at each step of the way. And all of your experience from all your years of bow hunting is what allows you. And we've hunted together several times. And one of the things that I've got from that is like, I'm not exactly sure what I should do right now. You're like, mm -hmm. draw back. Draw yeah. back, draw the boat right now. Yeah. Like yeah. A look at step step behind the tree. You know, and you, you, there's all this stuff that <laughs> yeah. like you have figured out like to you it's like the natural path. Like mm -hmm. if I was showing you how to kick somebody, right. I, you know, I, I would say not yet. Wait till you see now. Mm -hmm. Okay, fake with your hand and then you're gonna kick them. Right. You know, and there's all these things that just are second nature to mm -hmm. me. They're second nature to you when it comes to bow hunting because of this accumulation of data, of mm -hmm. information, experience. You're constantly out there in the woods, and you've done it many, 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 many times. And that it is this sort of improvisational thing where you have to utilize all your knowledge and all your understanding of all the different variables. Where's the wind blowing? Is it blowing towards me? Okay, we're good. Mm -hmm. Ooh, it's blowing behind me. We're kind of in trouble here. We got to get out of here. We got to get to a place where he's not going to wind us. Yeah. We got to figure out our approach. You know, we can't go this way because of that, or we can't go this way because there's some cows over there and they're going to bark. Mm -hmm. So we got to figure this out. Mm -hmm. And you, there's all those open ended variables will be navigated incorrectly by someone like me that doesn't know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. I'll go over there and step on a twig. Ah, shit, he took off. You know what I mean? <laughs> Whereas, like, you'll be thinking all of your experience will come into play and you'll be thinking, okay, what's the right way to approach this? And you'll have an actual answer. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's, that's one reason why I am pretty protective when people start second guessing hunting or being critical of hunting, just because I know how difficult it is. And guys who bow hunt know, you know, this isn't just out there murdering animals. I mean, this is hard, hard. And you have to be so in tune. First, you respect the animal. Otherwise, I mean, that's so difficult. You can't help but respect them. But then you just respect the country, too. I mean, you get so in tune with, with living out there. Um, I'll be here walking down the street or at the store. I'll get out. I'll feel the wind. And I'll be like, feel the wind on my face and go, okay, if I was hunting this way, I'd have good wind. You know, <laughs> or I'd feel it on my back of my neck. And I'm just noticing that, oh, I got to hate the wind on my neck. It's because I'm so used to hunting. Or I'll see, you know, a cow standing out in the field and perfectly broadside his leg forward, and I'll be like, oh, man, that's a perfect shot. You know, so you just get in this ultimate predator mindset where everything's the hunt, everything's like, you know, you're tuned in, everything's survival, everything's taking advantage of, of whatever opportunities are out there. And so it's just, you know, when that, that just becomes part of your life, and that's how it's been for me for a long time. And I know guys who bow hunted for a long time know exactly what I'm talking about. Well, it is, you know, people want to call bow hunting a sport. And I think there's a real problem with using the word sport. I think there's a real problem with uh, that because it's also basketball. Mm -hmm. It's also soccer. It's, it's, it's not a sport. It's a thing. And when you put a label on a thing, yeah. like you try to define the thing by the other things that have the label. Yeah. You know, it's like coffee, like caffeine is a drug. Mm -hmm. So is meth. Right. They're definitely not the same, you know. <laughs> you call them, no. you can call them both drugs, but man, I think you're doing a disservice. Yeah, you're exactly. confused. You're you're really getting everybody confused. Well, we don't have coffee because we're yeah. not in a meth. We're not meth heads. Oh no, no, no! You could just go to a diner. You have a cup of coffee with your eggs, and there's no one gets hurt. No, no mass shootings. No, <laughs> no one gets crazy. It's you're kind of doing a drug, and in in a sense, uh, is not the same kind of contrast, but there's. It's very different than any other sport. No, so I don't think it could be called a sport. I, I, I don't call it a sport. I call it a lifestyle. I just, because I think to be, um, you need to be immersed in it. It needs to be part of your lifestyle. Yeah. I mean, if you don't want to be dedicated to what it takes or you don't have time to that time commitment, don't bow hunt. I mean, that's all I say. It's so difficult. Yeah. It, it's just, and so if it's not part of your lifestyle, I think you're, it's sort of a disservice. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, there's there's artistry in the bow and arrow and releasing that perfect arrow. I mean, we shot up at your house today for how long did we shoot for? Well, this is one of the rare things that I'll ever get up at six o'clock in the morning for, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I don't have to because it was our idea. Like, when should we do this? I'm like, well, we should shoot before the podcast because it's going to be 100 degrees out here. Yeah. So let's uh, let's just get up. I'll pick you up at seven. We'll go get some breakfast. Yeah. We went to Jerry's fucking deli and Jerry's deli's not open at 7 a.m. Can you believe that shit? I can't. I was like, you Even lazy I never, bitches. I never heard of it till before today, but I still couldn't believe it. They usually have a big breakfast crowd, I thought. 
I don't know what's going on. But we had a good breakfast yeah. and we talked about fighting a lot. Yeah, we talked about uh, <laughs> some upcoming UFC events and some uh, Bellator events that we just watched. Yeah. And Michael Chandler knockout. Oof, oh, I know. Crazy. Michael Chandler's God. a beast. Yeah. Just, uh, yeah, fun stuff. And yeah. we talked about uh, well, this upcoming UFC, UFC 200. I know. Which Cameron Haynes going to be there. And uh, someone who uh, wins uh, a Hoyt giveaway mm -hmm. is going to get two tickets. How do they how do they get involved in this? Because I, I know TJ Dillshaw has been promoting yeah, it. Yeah, I would go to TJ's page and Hoyt's page. I, actually, I put it on my page. So I think you have to take a picture that says, I am defiant, like hashtag, I am defiant. And take a picture and post it on your social media. There's probably some other tags you need to put on there. But uh, if you do that, then you're in running for two tickets, uh, airfare, everything covered, going to UFC 200, which is going to be an insane card. Biggest event ever. Yeah. The, I mean, not just the biggest event ever, but the most fucking insane MMA card the world's ever known. I look at that card and I go, good Lord. I know. I know. And it's, it's just, I cannot wait. Yeah, it, it's just like I, we got the Olympic trials in Eugene coming up, and then right after that is uh, UFC 200. I'm pumped up. Yeah, it's gonna be nuts. You've been to a bunch of them, man. It's, yeah. it's uh, been fun. Oh God, yeah, definitely never quit UFC. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. There's nothing like being right there, right? There's nothing uh, like being there and hearing the slap of the shins and. What the, the, What I liked was I was at I can't remember which one it was. It was uh, Connor, oh, and Aldo, and and then be, sitting behind me was Leo, so I was closer than DiCaprio, <laughs> so that was kind of cool. Well, he he dresses like a character in a movie, like he's the Invisible Man. He's got glasses on, <laughs> hats. And yeah, yeah. It's funny. They yeah. all like a lot of those guys. They go to those events and they wear sunglasses inside the entire time. Yeah. So they hope they don't make eye contact with anybody. Well, everybody knew he was there. That's Definitely. How weird is that, though? I don't know if he wears sunglasses, <laughs> but like Vin Diesel was there, his sunglasses on. I'm like, is it bright in here? I was like asking Mike Goldberg, is it bright in here? Are you? Is it bright? Yeah. Why does he have sunglasses on? Like, what's going on here? <laughs> Somehow, the black guys can pull that off better. Yeah. Like, oh. if I see, like, Jay-Z with sunglasses on, I'm like, of course Jay-Z has sunglasses yeah, on. Yeah, why he's, wouldn't he? He's Jay-Z. <laughs> That's normal, right? But if uh, I saw, like, Matt Damon with sunglasses on, I'm like, take the glasses off, yeah, bitch. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if John Mayer had sunglasses on, I'd, I'd want to smack him. I'd yeah. want to take his scarf and smack him in the mouth. Yeah. Because he definitely have a scarf if oh. he has sunglasses on. You have to have a scarf, <laughs> don't you? I still, I still need to get my... Uh, bear hide coat done to oh, our two UFC. right. That's what you need. Yeah. The last bear you shot had this incredible thick coat. It was a huge bear. Yeah. It's like almost eight foot bear, right? Seven right. foot eight? Yeah. Yeah. Giant bear. That would make a lush coat. So I was going to make a coat and then wear it to the UFC with a keep hammering hat. Mm. Wasn't that the plan? That's the move. Maybe you should get a keep hammering hat made out of another bear that you killed and have a big top hat like Abraham Lincoln. That just says, keep hammering in sequence. <laughs> well, yeah, then w with the yeah with the bear hide trench coat. And then your, your, your company would definitely drug test you. They're like, get over here. I've been hanging out with that Rogan guy too long. Come on. <laughs> It'd be fun now. Give us some pee. But anyway, so we, uh, we shot today for hours, didn't yeah. we? Oh, yeah. 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 We started somewhere around 8, and uh, we were done. I mean, podcast started somewhere around noon. We, we, we pushed it to the wire. Yeah. It was it was good. But, you know, so we talk about bow hunting being a lifestyle and being immersed in it, and which you have been. you got a great setup for shooting arrows up at your in your backyard there. But, uh, you know, what we talked about today, too, amongst many other things, was with a bow, it's, it's so being a great shot is so difficult you have to be all in and focused on every single arrow you take one little side track trip with your brain on one shot and it's you know a foot to the left <laughs> you know, like what yeah. foot low what and yeah that, that's what i said i said well i said the problem is my arrow always hits where my pin is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so if it's off, it's because the pin was there. Well, you especially at the, sh the distance we're shooting. We're shooting at 70 yards. Yeah. So any tiny movement is exaggerated magnified, yeah. and magnified. Yeah. Yeah. But it's so much fun. It's the most fun. I mean, it's, it's great. You know, we, we love putting in the time. We love putting the arrows through the bow and uh, did it for hours today. Yeah. I don't, I don't think there's anything that I've ever practiced 
other than martial arts, martial arts is really fun to practice. But even martial arts, like drilling, is not nearly as fun as uh, sparring. Yeah. Sparring is fun, but like there's something about just drilling with a bow. It's the it's the same thing. It's like putting that arrow on that X, like m lining that sucker up and letting that thing fly is the mm -hmm. most intensely satisfying thing when it's all done. Like when we're shooting that elk today, and I have this bozo nose that John Dudley calls it a bozo nose. It's like these little pins that they use to hang up targets, and it's a foam pin. Yeah. And there's a, a behind it is the the metal piece. And the bozo nose is right in the center of where the heart would be on that elk. Mm -hmm. And when you send an arrow at 70 yards and it perfectly slides right into that bozo nose, which is, you know, not even an inch wide. Yeah. It's a massively satisfying feeling. That's a great feeling. Only outdone by when you do that on an animal. Yes. Or an elk. <laughs> yeah. I just remember, you know, and it's on video, but uh, this last, when was that? July. So what was it? Almost a year ago now, me and Roy were uh, we were after brown bear up there, and that uh, that boar sat up from its bed at forty yards, and just standing there as intimidating as anything—a big brown bear on with uh, just grass in between me and him, forty yards away, and that I I shot at forty and it hit. I, I guess it could have been maybe a half inch to the left. But it hits so perfect, and it's just like, man, that's a good feeling. And it's a frontal shot, which is a very difficult shot. Mm -hmm. you, your margin of error is so small, yeah. but you had enough confidence mm -hmm. because of all the practice and all the years and all the experience, you had enough confidence at 40 yards to say, this is going right in there. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, you can't, you're hunting dangerous game. You can't think about what could go wrong. Um, you know, you got to be so, so confident. You got to pick a spot. You got to go, just as we were talking about in your backyard, if you take, uh, if you just get distracted at all, you know, who knows where that arrow's going. So you got to be so confident, so focused and just know, it, stay in that shot the whole time. Um, because if you think about the worst case, yeah, you could wound that bear. The bear could, you know, if you make a bad shot, maybe to the left and it just slices his shoulder, maybe he comes and he can cover 40 yards very quickly. And so you start thinking about all that stuff, guaranteed you're going to make a poor shot. But when you're thinking about the only, you know, you've blocked out all that, all you're thinking about is that pin and where you want to hit on that animal and all, everything else is subconscious because of all the reps you've put in and then the rest takes care of itself. It is a, a very mental thing. The, the 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 aspect of executing the shot and mm -hmm. of even uh, under pressure lining up all the different elements that have to be lined up when you're ma making a shot like making sure you're not torquing your bow making sure your hands in a perfect position mm -hmm. making sure that the, your bubbles level mm -hmm. making sure that your peep sight is centered around the outside housing of the sight making sure that your anchors in the same exact spot every time making sure you don't move when you release the arrow Punch the trigger. So much Drop so much bow. going on. Yeah. And then Wallace bears in front of you. A yeah. grizzly bear. Yeah. <laughs> and you have to just all those reps and all that yeah. time practice has to come into play right now. Yeah, it's uh there's a lot to it. A lot to it. And there's a reason why not a ton of people have have done that. You know, I mean, and that's another reason why I love doing it. Yeah. And, and who I was with Roy at that on that hunt. And that's why he loves doing that and, or loved, you know, he's passed now. But uh, he had killed nine brown bear with his bow. So he he knew exactly what is involved and what it takes. And for me personally, the training ties in directly to the confidence I have in the woods, um, in the mountains or on the hunt, because I feel like in my, this is just my brain thinking, but I've sacrificed so much and can overcome all these physical challenges that it just gives me confidence to know that in very stressful, out of the ordinary circumstances, I'm not worried about anything. I'm going to, I'm going to make a perfect shot because my training has prepared me for difficult times. That's, that's difficult. That's stressful. Not unlike running a hundred miles, you know, that's difficult and stressful too. It's different, but it's still the same. It still prepares my body. So I just see, I see these as opportunities to, to overcome and, um, 
so I think that for me personally, they tie in directly, you know, uh, that challenge, challenge is a challenge to me. Yeah, it's, it's such an intense challenge too. <clears throat> Unlike uh, these ultra marathons, which I've got to assume are daunting and incredibly difficult, but it's a slow, monotonous battle with your discipline mm -hmm. and with your ability to control your body and your ability to withstand the pain and just stay the course. Mm -hmm. Whereas with bow hunting, it's this gigantic rush of adrenaline and this need in order to execute it correctly to control this very unusual state of being mm -hmm. where your heart's racing, your adrenaline's pumping. But instead of doing the normal stuff that you do when your heart's pumping, your adrenaline's flying, you're like, let's get out of here. Yeah. That's what your body thinks it's supposed to be doing. Obviously, why am I filled up with this fight or flight stuff? <laughs> right. What's going on? It must be flight's the move. That's yeah. a bear. Let's get out of here. Yeah. Instead of that, you have to stay incredibly calm and execute this intensely difficult fine motor skill mm -hmm. under massive amounts of pressure right you know i made bad shots today and there was nothing on the line right we we're just just hanging out like ah it's a foot low ah it's all the way like that's nothing on the line right but to do it on the line mm -hmm. on a, an animal is is this very uh pressure-filled moment it is and you have to figure out how to do all the things you've always done in that pressure-filled moment mm -hmm. and like I said in a very unusual way like instead of like guys coming at you punch them okay bang you yeah. know like that seems normal right. seems normal to like to react quick to get out of the way run right but it doesn't seem normal at all <sighs> to do that thing that you do when yeah. you release your relax your shoulders yeah center your pin like the, the, all that's not you're battling your own right. uh, endogenous chemicals right no it's uh and it's it's not easy you know a lot of people and I want to I, I want to tell the guys who are new into bow hunting a lot of people get into bow hunting and quit they get the bow they try and just find out it's just too difficult um you know and I was, I missed 16 deer in my first year bow hunting, clean missed them. So, I mean, I get it. And that's frustrating when you're used to rifle hunting, we see an animal, he's in rifle range, basically it's over, you know, it's done. You make the shot with the, you execute the shot, animal's dead with the bow, just because they're in bow range doesn't mean anything. The fact that they're in rifle range where you would be done if you had a rifle when the, when they're in rifle range, the hunt just started. And then in between rifle range getting into bow range, okay, now it's a hunt. And then there's no guarantee it's going to work out. So I get how difficult and frustrating how you want to just, okay, the bow hunting is not for me. Maybe I'm just going to go back to rifle hunting. But I would just say stick with it, maybe ramp it up a little bit because that's what I did. I just realized I, you know, I've never liked to fail. And so I couldn't be a failure, you know, with the bow. So I just, I killed one animal my first year, a spiked bull elk, missed um, 16 deer, and then came back the next year. And I was only hunting one state at this time, just Oregon, you know, just like anybody else, just could, couldn't could afford to travel anywhere. Next year came back and uh, killed a bear, a buck, and a bull. And uh, killed a, a Pope and Young 3x3 three three blacktail and a raghorn bull and just a, a small bear. But so that was... If you could fill those three tags, those are the only three tags I ever bought, that was like a monumental year. So I was able to come back and just overcome failure, just like every new bow hunter is probably going to experience because it's so very humbling and, uh, and find success. So I would just, if I give any advice, just to respect the challenge of the bow and just know that failure early on is part of the deal. And then, you know, just like me, I've, I've, uh, I've navigated it now, and now failure is the exception, and uh, and that's just dedication and time, just the experience. And I think it's important to point out. <clears throat> I don't want to speak for you, but I know you feel this way. Um, the bow hunting is incredibly challenging and incredibly rewarding, and something that's driven you as a passionate person and someone who just uh, lives this lifestyle and, and gets so much from it. And you want to tell people about that, but. It's not like you're in a camp against people who use the rifle. And you I know you think of all hunters as being all a part of this one group that really need to support each other. Oh, naps no. Rifle hunting. I mean my kids rifle hunt. I one of the they they've done both, but one of the greatest hunts I've had, including all my own, 
was um, in 2004, my father-in-law drew a once in a lifetime bighorn sheep tag for the Eagle Cap Wilderness, which is where I, I always elk hunted. And in Oregon, you get one shot at a sheep. If you don't kill a sheep, you'll never get another tag. If you kill one, you still never get another tag. So that's it. You get one in your life. So he drew it. He's 63 years old. So I set up uh, this trip. I went in there and scouted me and Tanner, my, my oldest son. I think he was 14 at the time. We went in and found this nice ram. I mean, a big ram for back there. And, uh, you know, had a plan. So um, hired a horse packer to, to bring my father-in-law up there. Uh, Barry Cox is the horse packer's name. And so we went up there. We got hammered with snow for the first five days of the hunt. The hunt's a 10-day season, September 1st to the 10th. And uh, just got hammered. Couldn't see anything. And I would go out every day looking for if I could see tracks to see if the sheep went off the mountain and could never find them. Finally, the, the weather broke and found the ram, got down in there. This is, as I said, 2004, so this is 12 years ago. Um, so my father-in-law is 75 now and, uh, we got down there in there 138 yards from the Ram. Um, he got a rest on a rock and he dropped that Ram and rifle hunt. One of the most special hunts I've ever been on to see him get his once in a lifetime Ram. It's his greatest trophy. It's on his wall right now. Um, I kept all the hide from that sheep. He got a shoulder mount on it, but I had the, the back half of that hide and the legs. I, I kept everything made into a stool at my house. So that the whole back half of the hide and the legs are a stool and, uh, that, that hunt. So yeah, it wasn't a bow hunt. I'm not, I don't, I don't rank bow hunting, rifle hunting. I, we're all hunters. And even if you want to get even further down to it, even with a bow, I shoot a Hoyt. I don't care what bow you shoot. I never tell anybody, here's what bow I think you should shoot. I, I, I shoot a Hoyt. I don't care what you shoot. Just shoot a bow. If you, if you want a bow hunt, buy whatever you want. It doesn't even make any difference to me. I just, I'm just cool. I'm just cool with you being part of the bow hunting brotherhood. But right, so, it's not like Matthews versus Hoyt. No, I don't care. I don't care. Uh, I mean, PSE, shoot whatever you want. I just, this is what I shoot and it works for me. Get what, get what works for you is my best advice. So I don't, I don't say it has to be in this camp i don't say you have to be a bow hunter i don't say rifle hunting is any less of a challenge it's a different challenge that's all there is to it respect it all um as i said my favorite my favorite hunt um so far in my life has been that rifle sheep hunt with my father-in-law but uh yeah so i'm i don't i don't know and i speaking of um me giving advice, you know, again, here's one thing that I never do on social media. I share what I do. I never tell anybody to do what I do. I don't want people to do what I do. I want you to do, I, I want you to do what, what you need to do to feel satisfied. Um, I never say, Hey, I ran 13 miles. If you don't run 13 miles, you're a pussy. Never. I would never dream of saying that. I never say, I lift every day. If you don't lift every day, you don't want it as bad as me. I'm, that's never. So I've never given advice. I, I don't remember ever giving advice on any of my social media. All I do is say, hey, shot my bow today. Anybody else shoot their bow today? People are always trying to give me advice on what I need to do or what, how I should be doing it. But one thing I won't do is give advice. I share what I do and I just, I love when you guys share what you do and I just want you to have a passion for it, but you don't need, I, you, I'm not trying to tell people to do what I do. I've seen people give advice when UFC fighters are training. Mm -hmm. They're giving advice about how these guys are uh, moving around and what he's doing wrong is dropping his hands and what he's doing wrong here is doing yeah. this. Like it's hilarious. Yeah. See like high level world class fighters and they're getting advice by people who have no business giving them advice. They don't yeah. know what they're talking about, mm -hmm. but yet there's this desire, this compelling desire to tell people what to do. Yeah. I, <laughs> I, I don't have that desire. I Good mean, for you because you tell yourself what to do. That's I, why you've, you've exercised it from the list of possibilities. Yeah. I just, I like, to me, I just try to lift, run, shoot every day. The only reason I've been successful at anything is because I'm not, I always say I'm not talented at it. I just work hard at it. So, but you are talented. I don't know what that, what talent word means. I'm not sure what talented means. 
Well, here's what I know. Like, are you good at it? Good at what? You're good at bow hunting. You're good at archery. You're talented, right? <laughs> I don't know. Is that a talent? It seems like know. a talent. Well, I don't think I'm great at running. But the only reason why I have success at it is because I run a lot. Right. But you can say, when someone says, uh, well, so what kind of exercise do you do? Well, I run 100 miles uh, in 24 hours. Whoa. That's a, that's a thing. What is that thing? Is that a talent? <laughs> no. Well, what is it? Is it an ability? It's an ability, right? I guess it's an ability. So what is the difference between an ability and a talent? I you think, know? I, well, everybody has ability. So I think what I do, everybody could do. What about Liam Neeson in that movie where he says, I have a very special set of skills? You have that, right? You got filthy skills. <laughs> <laughs> I, my That's only, another podcast, folks. You got to go back and listen to the other one we did and understand the definition of filthy skills. Right, exactly. No, but I just think that uh, I think if you take anybody with, with my skill set and if you just shoot your bow every day, if you want to run, the, um, so, so if you want to run, if you run miles every single day, you're going to have success. That's all I've done. I don't follow some training plan. All I do is run miles. Right. But archery entails a little bit more than that. Not just left foot, right foot, left foot, right foot, keep going. Yeah. There's a lot of, there's a lot going on. As we discussed, there's a lot going on as far as the knowledge of your stance and where your oh, front yeah, shoulder yeah, yeah. position is. And Technique wise, you got to get that nailed. Right. So you have to get that and then you have to be able to execute that. So when does it become, become a talent? I don't know but I don't got it. <laughs> you know, like when does it become a talent? Like someone could say, you know, that I'm a talented martial artist because I, I know how to do certain things. Yeah. But, but if you went back and watched me the very first day I did it, I didn't yeah. have any talent. I yeah. had nothing. I just, I knew zero. So it's not like something that uh, I inherently had in me. I just needed to be coaxed out by a good coach. Mm -hmm. No, no, it's just hard work. And but if you ask me if I'm talented, yeah, I know what I'm doing. Yeah, you know, I'm, I've been doing it forever. I right. know what I'm doing. If you ask me how to execute a sidekick, I'll, I'll show you how to do it. I know yeah. how to do it. Yeah, hundred percent. No, no, no um, insecurity whatsoever about my ability to execute something. Yeah, and I think that's the same thing with you and bow hunting. It's just the word talented implies ease of learning. Yeah, I, when I think of talent. Um Genetic freaks. Yeah, I, that's what I think. But and, it's like an athletic thing, right? That's like a right. That's that's what, when I think talent. I think that I think some like people, a LeBron James, right? Or you watch them run, and mm -hmm. you're just like, what? Right? It doesn't even seem like the same species, right? You know, that's that's God given talent to Carl me. Carl Lewis, right? Yeah, yeah. And so to me, it's like I feel like what I do, anybody could do if they would put in the same amount of time I have, right? That's see, but I, I see like a talented fighter, you know, I see a guy like, um, you know, fill in the blank. I see a guy like uh, George St. Pierre or something like that. Yeah. I see a talented fighter, right? Mm -hmm. And you, you see that guy, you're like, there is no denying that that guy has a very special talent. Mm -hmm. But what, what does that mean though? I mean, how much of that is his physical ability? Because there's a lot of guys who look like him, probably yeah. lift as much weight as him. But he would fuck them up. Mm -hmm. And is it because of the amount of time he spent learning that? Is it because of his mind? Because he's able to accurately and objectively look at his own abilities and understand what needs to be improved upon and what doesn't? Mm -hmm. Is it his intelligence and his understanding of what he needs to learn and what how he needs to execute it and how to be creative in executing that in a way that his opponent isn't allowed to pattern? Yeah. Well, maybe. But what all those things are is hard work, mm -hmm. hard work and dedication plus abilities and knowledge. Right. So you're talented, dude. I'm sorry. <laughs> Just trying to tell you. <laughs> well, thanks. Uh, 100%. Hey. You're talented. Oh, uh, no. I don't know. To anybody who's killed every single time they've been on a big game hunt for as many years as you, mm -hmm. that's talent. 2009? That's seven years. It's just super lucky. That's bullshit. <laughs> super lucky is two years. <laughs> One thing. Once you get into three years, people start going, huh, where's this guy hunting at the zoo? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How close is he getting? <laughs> yeah. No, it's all good. But part of it is, you know, I just I just fell in love with archery. Yeah. You know, and so that's, that's where it was bred. And then I wanted... I loved writing. I loved sharing my, my experiences. And uh, so I, the more success I had, the more I had to write about. Mm -hmm. And uh, people seemed to, to uh, really identify with um, 
just the hard hunts, you know, the stuff. I remember writing articles committed to the wilderness, uh, uh, blood, sweat, and bulls, um, dream catcher about, and all those were about overcoming. And so that's really where people started identifying with me a little bit. And so, um, that's what I loved about it. Just, just being able to be just the regular guy, um, with, with, as I said, I don't believe I have any special skill set, but just working hard and overcoming and, uh, you know, it's interesting. You've always been about inspiring others. Why? Why do you think it's that's a big been a big part of you? It's not just about pursuing your own very difficult adventures, but it's also been about inspiring others to chase their dreams. Why? Why do you think that is? Um, it's almost like you have a calling. I don't know. I just, uh, you know, I know what it, I just know what it feels like to have people not believe in you, you know? And so, um, you know, I want to be somebody who believes in people and believes in what, what they're capable of. And, uh, you know, so when people are working hard and that's why I like doing the win a bow is people coming and showing up and trying to win my bow and, and compete and, and give their all that, that is really powerful to me because I believe in those people. I don't care if, and I, I you know, people don't beat me, but I always give my bow away to the person who I think uh, sacrificed the most that day. And to me, um, that means more than almost anything. I just want people to believe they're capable, special, and then they can achieve any dream they have because I didn't feel like I had that type of support. Um, so I, I just know how important it would be right. or, or it is to people. And now, not only to the strangers or the people that follow me, but to my kids, I just need to be an example to them, um, you know, just that they can achieve big things if they want, if they put in the time. And, uh, you know, I just, I just want them to know that they're, you, you can get out there and chase almost any dream, and if you dedicate yourself to it enough, it can become reality. So I'm just trying to, to live that life and, and give my kids, uh, I guess, I don't know, something, something to aspire to also. It's, it's just very interesting to me that you've always um, been about not just, uh, not just pursuing these things, but um, expressing all of your, all, all your feelings and all the struggle and inspiring other people to go and pursue their dreams in, in this in this interesting way. And I feel like there's a lot of people in this life that feel compelled for whatever reason. Maybe it's because of the dissatisfaction of their youth or the experiences that they've had with people that have inspired them mm -hmm. for whatever whatever the motivation is. But they they almost have like a compelling calling. And I think that's what you have. And I've always wondered why. Mm -hmm. Why you feel like you have that. But... I think it's just because um, bow hunting is just that awesome. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, like man, is. people need to know about this. Yeah, it is. I mean, I just, you know, as I said, it changed my life. And I just, if it could change somebody else's life for the better, then, man. It how, can, how, and it will. How good could that be? Well, I keep getting these messages from people that, uh, from listening to our podcast, have taken up archery. Uh, both compound archery and traditional archery. I know mm -hmm. a lot of people that have taken up uh, Duncan Trussell take, took up archery. Oh yeah, yeah. She's got a recurve. Shoots a recurve in his backyard. That's awesome. It's, it's amazing. He loves it. Loves it. Yeah. And there's so many people that are getting involved in archery, and I think the Hunger Games had a nice impact yeah. on that. You know, yeah. people are like, damn, that looks cool. I want to go yeah. try that. Yeah. You know, you see, uh, what is that girl's name? Jennifer Lawrence. Yeah. Pretty girl. So pretty. Yeah. You see her shooting that bow, and you're like, oh, badass. And we and think so we've talked pretty. about this before. Yeah, I think In, so. Anybody shooting a bow is automatically, like a hot girl is automatically hotter. Oh, definitely. <laughs> yeah, there's a uh, a photo online of uh, Christy Mack, so, some uh, adult film star, Christy Mack. Very lovely lo young lady. And she's shooting a bow, and people yeah. are very excited by she's it. She's in the entertainment industry. Yes, she entertains a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, no, archery is, is powerful. Um, and it's God, the tradition, you mm -hmm. know, I mean, Oh yeah. Massive. It's, uh, just in the history of it, you know, it's been around 
who, who knows when archery started. I, I couldn't put you know a, a time on it, but it's, it's been around for eons. It's one of those rare weapons that has somehow or another become more prevalent, not as a weapon, yeah, more prevalent as a discipline than it is as a weapon. Like it's almost like the art form morphed in a couple different directions. Yeah. Like it exists as a method of acquiring f food still with some people, like traditional archery. Mm -hmm. Like some people, they only hunt with traditional bows. Like doesn't Aaron Schneider, isn't he taking this whole year and just hunting with, so, a, yeah. with a bow? I think so, yeah. With a um, recurve or a stick bow, one of those? I don't know. Yeah. But, but it's also, besides hunting, it's also like probably even more popular with people just shooting at paper, just yeah. shooting targets. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just yeah. as a discipline. No, and for those people that take that discipline into the mountains, um, they're going to experience when they are successful a, a, another life-changing event. Mm. You know, the reverence, uh, just taking a life with a sharp stick, essentially, and uh, just it's a it's a powerful deal. It's a powerful thing, and uh, it's really hard to explain. You know. I tried to explain and share it the other day with a bear video I posted briefly and it just it's just I can't put it into words what it means um, um, when an animal when you take an animal with a with your arrow you know I just it's just really hard to to quantify what that means but it's just I guess we can just uh, leave it it's it's powerful and it's life-changing it is definitely that it's definitely that. And uh, one of, what I was saying was that so many people have messaged me, uh, both on Facebook and Instagram and and people that I've met that have gotten into archery because mm -hmm. of the podcast that you and I have had. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I wonder, it. I, I think it's, it's very possible that this is a growing sport. It's very yeah. possible. People are always looking for cool stuff to do. Mm -hmm. You know, hey, let's go rock climbing. Hey, let's go uh, kayaking. Hey, let's go bowling. You know, they, they're looking for something fun to do. And a lot of people are taken to archery. And yeah. I don't know what the growth rates are, but I would imagine that it's. Uh, it seems to me that people are getting into it a lot these days. Yeah, well, I mean, we're we're immersed in it, so maybe we're hearing more about it. But I get that feeling, too. I mean, I go to the bow rack back home in Springfield, Oregon, and it's jammed pack. You know, I mean, yeah. there's a lot of people in there buying bows. And uh, just, you know, I don't know. I don't know how you can get a more healthy healthy uh, endeavor than going out, shooting your, shooting your bow and arrow, and then going hunting. I mean, that doesn't get more pure than that. It doesn't. So how often are you going to do this podcast? We do once a week? I don't know. You could totally do once a week. This, this totally can be done. Actually, I think this is it. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're going to keep doing it, right? Yeah. I, I, well, we'll see. I guess every Listen, time. Every easy, time. This is the same little ghost that's in the back of your brain that tries to get you to quit that race at 75 miles because you're not going to run 120. Yeah. You can't, you can't back out of this. This is a challenge. This is just a different kind of challenge. You did a great job so far. First episode, <laughs> I give it an A+. Plus. Jamie? <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. It's way better than my first episode. <laughs> first episode of my podcast was terrible. Well, Almost want, unlistening. Do you want to be my second guest? Fuck yeah. <laughs> I'll be your second guest. I'll I'll, I'll give, be your training wheels until you can get this sucker going. <laughs> well, I'll help you. I, I really feel like it's important. I think you should do it. I think it's great. I think it's another method of that you could use to do what you're already doing. Yeah. Well, thank you for believing in me. It, uh, it means so much to me, and I uh, think everybody who's listening and thank you man if it wasn't for you and uh the first time we ever did a podcast you bringing over that bow and and teaching me how to shoot it correctly and then teaching me the fundamentals of bow hunting and taking me on a hunt it's it's changed my life good in a well, big way <laughs> then it's been a win-win it's a win-win ladies and gentlemen <laughs> so wrap this sucker up this is your show all right. Uh, how do I wrap it up? <laughs> Any way. way you want. <laughs> what do you That's say? That's the beautiful thing. You, you don't say, have to say anything. See you later. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> Is that your impression of me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just do an impression of me. I'll laugh. No, because, yeah. Come on, right. fuckers. <laughs> yeah. See, I can't do it. Oh, uh, you can't swear. That's right. <laughs> Unfortunate. All right, guys. <laughs> well, hey, till next time, keep hammering. That's a great way to end. Huh? <laughs>